and thank you for the invitation to speak. It's lovely to see you all. Um, housekeeping before I start, um, please accept my apologies. Some of the images and the footage here are from back before a 2,000 pixel wide presentation would have been considered outlandish. So, 10 years ago, um, I gave a talk that set in motion a bit of a change in my career. Nothing that would necessarily impact you, although I am talking and you're all here. So, um, the talk was essentially a takedown of this guy. Uh, this is Philippe Stark, one of my sort of all time design heroes, prolific product designer, over 10,000 patents to his name. Um, and this is a, a picture of the Juicy Salif. I don't know if anyone owns one. They're about 75 quid now. Um, but it doesn't work. Uh, what it does is, I've got a pointer. Basically, the juice is here, and it's meant to go here, but it runs down here. <laughs> this is the hot burter. Now, I've used one of these, and they are, they're beautiful to hold, aluminium, plastic, but gorgeous. It's a stovetop kettle, um, and gets quite hot, obviously, because it's a stovetop, and um, it pours. It pours really, really badly. <laughs> like, this badly. <laughs> um, that's 350 pounds. They're really, uh, they're not, <laughs> they're not that common anymore. Um, and what you'll see is that it's actually burning his arm <laughs> because there's a pipe where steam comes out at the back. So what's happened in the last 10 years? I've lost a lot more hair. Um, since this sort of younger, more arrogant version of me took to the stage, and the best way maybe to contextualize this is through lived experience and, and talking a bit about research. So back in 20-something, I was still putting my work together. I was still figuring out which kind of um, domain I wanted to be in, still experimenting and coming up with sort of deeper domain knowledge. Uh, and I was inadvertently transitioning from a T-shape, something that Louise is probably going to talk about a little bit later, to what's known as a broken comb. So this is where you've kind of got your empathy and cross-disciplinary skills across the curve, and then all these sort of weird craft skill bits that end up being different lengths. And now, thanks to a bunch of random career choices and happenstance, I had opportunities to be relatively well-versed with the inner workings of a whole mess of different sectors. Um, I've always felt that new jobs and opportunities should scare a little bit. Um, not a sort of jump shock horror movie kind of thing, but like a frog, slowly getting boiled. Um, this is because I tended to work in sort of interesting spaces that presented a, a real challenge to me. And going from zero to knowledge is a bit of a buzz. Um, sitting in a meeting while everyone else is sort of spewing out acronyms is kind of enjoyable so long as you remember to sort of listen and take notes and have the confidence to ask questions. Um, and then remember, at some point, someone in that room, probably, thought it was a good idea to invite you along. Um, and what's great about this role is there's no option to sort of sit and learn, unless you're a total narcissist. Uh, it's unlikely you'll feel that sensation, necessarily, not in the same way if you are a subject matter expert. Now, you'll find yourself in that situation because someone values you as you and your thinking and your approach, what your experience outside that sector and specialization can bring to the party. So the best thing to do is give yourself a break. Luxuriate in the knowledge that this person or persons uh, thought that hiring you for you was a good idea. You should feel confident, and then you are also there to learn and educate. And why would someone bring in an outsider? Well, if they're smart, it's to shake things up and change the conversation and light a fire under people and get new voices in the room and maybe start sort of questioning the norm. Um, almost every job I've had over the last 24 years has involved uh, this at some stage. It's kind of the major ones. So games, um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s when little three and a half inch discs were around. Uh, lovely cover art that never really represented what you ended up playing. Uh, and I graduated to sort of the N64 and the PS1. I knew very little about the industry, except that it took a long time. Um, it was, it took kind of longer to make a game than it would to make a movie. Uh, and the industry at that time uh, was about to outgross the movie industry. And everything was really slow. 
financial services. Uh, if anyone worked in financial services in the mid 2000s, um, digital banking tools were really fucking awful. Swearing's all right, isn't it? Good. Um, and it had been fueled by startups chomping at their heels. Uh, most of what we use nowadays is kind of slippy. So you go in, do the thing, get out. 15 years ago, everything stuck. And it stuck because of the way things were made very, very slowly. And not slowly in a good way. Um, and usually there were sort of legacy systems involved. And working as a UX practitioner meant you had a sponsor and then whatever bit of the IT team the organization felt it could spare. Advertising, uh, bits and pieces. Like I showed up on my first day as a director, walked into a partnership meeting. There were 12 people there. Four people knew I was joining. Two people knew what I was going to do. And one person was a friend of mine. Um, this was all fast, very, very fast, like really quick projects. But everything we were doing was pretty much disposable. We were at that point where there was no real positive end goal. It was some digital litter, I suppose. There was nothing designed with permanence in mind. Majority world transport, my previous, previous role. Um, I traveled, but not to the extent um, that was required for this role, and certainly not really in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we went from a B2B to a design-led organization. Um, no team to speak of when I joined, and then about 30, 35 when I left. Uh, this is what I do now, um, and I own a phone. So there's no room for arrogance here and little room for assumption. So as long as you don't mind being curious and asking questions and reading and reaching out to people, you get on. Um, this is Judy Estrin, who's done loads of stuff. She co-founded Cisco and was on the board for FedEx and Disney. And she said this, arrogance indicates you're not listening to customers, employees, and you're not looking at your competitors honestly. So my beef with Stark was this kind of, not about art as design or design as art. Um, where things stuck for me was maybe how he sort of foisted his work on people. Confidence in his own ability was a little bit nauseating, maybe more in the arrogance space. And his output, it landed in people's homes, um, and it was often actually poorly made and quite expensive. And a lot of times people are just like too careful too. I mean, it's like, I think it's more useful to like make things happen and then like apologize later than it is to make sure that you dot all your eyes now and then like just not get stuff done. So this is 2005. Uh, and this is a, a small talk that he gave at Harvard. Now jump ahead to 2012, and he's starting to cement innovation culture at Facebook, giving it license to behave in certain ways, but to an audience of hundreds of thousands rather than this many people who are in the room on that day. And we ended up with this. He released this manifesto for kind of carelessness in innovation. Uh, much of what people admired at Facebook was this meteoric rise to success, this sort of hockey stick, if you will. And they were doing things differently, untethered by systems and oversight and regulation and the general sort of albatross that the rest of the world had to live with. They charted their own path. Um, and he you know, printed a blueprint showing us. So why shouldn't we follow it? Um, this is the manual. It was published in 1988 by the KLF, and it's a step-by-step -step guide to making a pop hit. Um, there are not that many bands who admit to using it, but um, it's a band in Germany and the Klaxons. Uh, and if you read about how the Klaxons make music, they all said, yeah, this is how we do it. Every time we win, it's because of this book. And there's some great lines in it. Don't worry about being accused of being a thief. Even if you were to have not got the time to take the trial and error route, and that said, hacking your way to success with little consideration for others has a way of catching up with you. This is what Mark said in August. It's like every day you wake up and you're being punched in the stomach. I used to run a lot, but the problem with running is you can think a lot. To make people a little more modest intellectually and aware that a great many things which have been thought certain turned out to be untrue, and that uh, there's no shortcut to knowledge, and that the understanding of the world, which to my mind is the underlying purpose that every philosopher should have, that that is a very long and difficult business. 
about which we ought not to be dogmatic. And this is the antithesis of what we've witnessed. It's this wonderful kind of approach to slow. Now, on this interesting graph that I cobbled together, we've got slow and fast and uh, confident and arrogant. So, oh, if anyone's playing uh, Design Talk Bingo, uh, you're going to win, because down there you've got Dita Rams. Um, then in the middle you've got the KLF. And then over here you've got Facebook. And it's ilk. So it's this idea that it's kind of where the unicorns sit. You know, throw things at the wall, disrupt, you know, see what sticks. And this bit is such a really unpleasant tasting, sort of fast, arrogant approach to things. It's almost like the pluralization of Lego. Legos. Um, some of you will be here just kicking off your career. Some of you a bit more seasoned. Some of you will be old and tired like me. <laughs> Wherever you are, think about the opportunities you have at your disposal. You're here. You don't need to know all the things. If you're enthusiastic about your work, you will inevitably keep learning and you'll meet people. You are practicing what I would call anti-arrogance. Right. Hands up, everyone, please. Right. Hands down, if, <laughs> if you have played with Lego in the past. Oh, fuck, this makes this bit redundant. Um, so for those of you who haven't, I think I saw someone over there. Uh, Lego comes in boxes. There's packets. There's um, instructions. They, bricks and pieces come in bags, and they're usually numbered. And depending on what you're building, it's either like a little pamphlet or it's massive volumes. Um, I've played with Lego a fair bit, not so much now. Um, but when I was a kid, there were lots of hand-me-downs. We had these two great big trays of assorted bits of Lego. This is the sort of 80s when it was sensible and they limited custom parts. Your astronaut was basically the same as your motorbike rider, um, which was kind of nice because all you had to do is stretch your brain and go, they're 27 kilometers apart. But when I put it here, it's this, and here, it's this. In the 80s, a large Lego kit was considered about 600 pieces. Nowadays, it's thousands. Um, this thing is 5,000 pieces. That's a huge jump. Um, if anyone hasn't heard the story of how Lego almost went bankrupt, there are lots of case studies online, so please go and read about it. It is fascinating. The sort of TLDR version of it is around the turn of the century, they were churning out something like 13,000 custom pieces, which, you know, this is a long way from the astronauts and motorcyclists, almost double the number. And were kids having more fun because of all these extra pieces? What need was Lego satiating? And this feels lazy, kind of lazy thought and execution. People aren't interested in parts. They're interested in the whole. And some of the coolest builds are put together using existing parts. This waterfall does not require any super weird parts. It's not the custom elements. It's the creativity. It's the custom thinking, if you like. Um, think about the last really exciting thing you saw. You know, was it technology bending, or was it a really smart way of using something that exists? You know, this sort of overly clever approach, is it ultimately overly shallow? This is my son. Um, he made a pizza. It's also a city. <laughs> and it's, it hasn't got any custom pieces in it. Uh, limited palettes are the things that make creating interesting. They help us flex our imagination. And so from a certain perspective, I suppose, it's quite, um, it's quite easy to assume that Lego kits are simple affairs. This is about 900 pieces. And there's a bunch of ways to tackle building a Lego set. So you can tip it all out and sift through it, or you can null. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the procedure of nulling, it's not just for Lego, it can be for any bits. If you think of cooking, it's a bit like your sort of mise en place. Everything's sort of set out in the way before you start. Um, it's a creating an order of operation, making sure that all your bits, but it's also about the start of the process. Some of it's innate if you've built you know, Ikea stuff, you know, the little dowels go in the holes, you know, those little metal things of catching bolts, all of that kind of thing. I don't know, well, actually, <laughs> hopefully there's no one here who's arrogant enough to think they could put together an Ikea kitchen without instructions. 
similarly, I don't think there's anyone here who could put together like a sizable Lego kit without instructions, all the parts coming separately. In many ways, knowing is a confidence boost, and at the same time, it tempers our arrogance. The instructions for, we'll probably say you need these bits. Here are 10 of these, here are 12 of these. Um, there are meant to be 32, but there are 33 pieces of these. Uh, there are 12, and they're meant to be 14 pieces, but that's okay, uh, so long as you know beforehand. It's like, that's why you know. So what's the difference between building a Lego set and a product for people in a country you've never visited? Not a great deal. Um, to do justice to your users, though, knowing is a pretty decent approach. It's methodical, it's deliberate. You take a step back before diving in with solutions. My travel up to a couple of years ago looked something like this. It's pretty much entirely Northern Hemisphere. On the top of the map is given to the Northern Hemisphere, and the bottom is given to the Southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how... Where else could you put the northern hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. So this is an amazing bit from the West Wing. Uh, they're talking about the Gaul Peters projection. Um, essentially, the Mercator map that we all use and are familiar with misrepresents the world dramatically. And the Gaul Peters map rectifies that. So there you go. Um, basically, this... This northern and southern thing is completely inaccurate. The way that the northern version works on normal maps uh, is, was basically created for sailing. So it showed passageways, it showed big pieces of ocean. So I'd spent most of my time traveling in minority world cities, and my influence was pretty much entirely European. Um, the Mercator map set the tone for how we treat countries in the majority world. Africa is one of those continents where countries are African continent first and country last. Like you wouldn't say, I'm going to North America when you go to Canada, or I'm going to Asia if you're going to India. It's just not the taxonomy we use in the minority world. Um, around the middle of 2019, I had a phone call from a friend who said, come and work for this business. We are B2B, data-based, we need to spin up and move to a design-led B2C organization. So uh, come and develop some products, build out a product team, um, and they're based in Cape Town in Africa. Um, so I packed my monochromatic suitcase and I went to Africa. Um, and I fell in love with cities and countries and places and culture, and I was really, really lucky to visit lots of different places. Dar es Salaam, um, was not on my bucket list. I never really thought, you know what, I, I should go to Tanzania and I should hang out in Dar es Salaam. Uh, but I learned more about myself in six months of travel across Africa and, and actually Mexico than I think I could ever appreciate. I was building out my own lived experience. So before going to Africa, my limited understanding and the way that I put things together was culture at the top, climate in the middle, and infrastructure at the bottom. That's it, my Neapolitan ice cream lens. And you can take that lens anywhere. As someone who lives here in the UK, it's quite easy to appreciate how the ice cream lens can be applied potentially a bit arrogantly by people who don't live here. Fish, chips, cup of tea, bad food, worse weather, Mary fucking Poppins, London. <laughs> but the ice cream lens is kind of dangerous. Uh, it's arrogant if you stop there. But if you use it as a base for something like remote sensing exercises, it's a really powerful way to start. So my ice cream lens for two East African countries. So what did I assume? Everything is alien. Again, not really. You know, coffee, cigarettes, food, it's all kind of there. Slightly disparate, you know, like fundamentals, I suppose. Uh, for example, the hotel I stayed in served amazing curry. And it wasn't until I started asking people, I was like, curry? Well, it turns out in the 17th century, the uh, Portuguese lost control of Zanzibar, the Amanis came in, and they built up the trading relationships with India and imported loads of spices into the country. And all of a sudden, you've got curries and samosas and chutneys, and this I did not know. And why would I? I had no lived experience. I hadn't asked the question. I assume it's hot. 
Uh, if you go to Uganda, it's actually really rainy. It's got two rainy seasons, and it's one of the best farming countries in Africa. I assume everything is broken. It isn't. Some of the infrastructure, obviously, is a little bit knackered. But then there are things like this. Uh, this is the Entebbe Kampala Expressway. Uh, it takes you from Uganda's main airport into the city centre in 30 minutes. And it used to take two hours. The catch is that a lot of this is funded by the Chinese government and Chinese investors, uh, which is kind of turning into a sort of geopolitical problem. I did not know this until I started seeing this kind of signage when I was walking around the city. So how about we change altitude? What's at a macro level? And at what point do things begin to change? At what point do you start asking questions when you go somewhere? Look at your feet and work your way up. So we've got our ice cream. Culture, climate, infrastructure. I'm being flippant, I suppose, but you cannot stop at the ice cream lens and expect to build something useful or relevant. If you must assume, be ready to turn those assumptions into questions. Ask all the questions. One of the things I did before I started traveling was I wrote down every stupid question I could imagine, and then I asked people. And sometimes the detail will surprise you. Um, I was in Mexico, I couldn't find like a, a fixer, and so I phoned up a city guide, and this guy was sort of used to taking people around tourist spots, and I said, can you take me to all the places you would never take anyone? <laughs> so we were going around street markets, and there was a kid on a stool with uh, like a walkie-talkie in his hand, stood in the middle of the road, and I said, what's he doing? And he said, oh, he mines the stools. So if he sees the police coming, he lets all the stool holders know, and they pick up their blankets, and they bugger off. You don't know that unless you ask those questions, unless you have that lived experience. The trick is to create strata, eons of rock, I suppose. And arrogance is fast, and this is slow. Like you're laying out your tools and resources. You're being methodical. You're taking your time. You're ensuring there's, you have enough insight to be able to make sensible decisions. And that's how we experiment. We put things together, then we share, then we take them apart again. We do it again, but better. There's a real difference in a decade, and we've seen a lot of change. Confidence will only come from this, this lived experience, and experience can be garnered from this sort of sharing and reading and playing and building and testing. If you redraw this path to Dutton, arrogance and confidence are really not very far apart. Confidence is the long way around, but arrogance is really, really easy. It's so close to Dutton. And there's this little tiny gap um, and it looks so easy to cross that gap. We need to recognize the shortcut exists, and we need to learn how to push back. Going all the way around that loop is laborious, but it's rewarding, um, no matter how tempting that little tiny gap is. But we'll take our time, we'll collect our data, we'll null our work, and we'll avoid assumption. And only then, really, can we cultivate this kind of positive impact that will hopefully last for decades. And with any luck, we will avoid arrogance along the way around too. Thanks very much.